Today we're going to look at three cases that are eerily similar. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Maneater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings in the world, you've come to the right place. Be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. Let's get started. Before we do get started, I just want to tell you guys that I love to binge watch shows. It's like one of my favorite hobbies. And I recently watched The American. I had never watched it before and I started it and I loved it and I went through all six seasons. As I was researching cases, I came across three murders that seemed to indicate that maybe some spy activity was happening. So of course I jumped on it. I knew I had to cover them because obviously I was finishing up this show and I loved it. And I came across these cases and I was like, Maybe this was spy activity and maybe they were murdered. Um, so, of course, we're going to dive into some theories and things like that. So, buckle up and get ready. On November 29th, 1970, a man was hiking with his two daughters in a remote wooden valley in western Norway. And as this man and his two daughters are hiking, they would come across a badly burnt body. And once investigators made it to the scene of the crime, they realized that this wasn't going to be a typical investigation into murder or maybe a possible suicide. So wedged between rocks on a hiking trail was a badly burnt body of a woman. And as investigators are examining the scene and they see this body, they realize that the tags on her clothing had been removed. Somebody took the time to remove clothing tags, and obviously this was for identification purposes. It was said that the front side of her body was severely burnt and that she was in a boxer's position. And I assume that means her fists were up. And one could assume that she was found this way because she was defending herself. So the front of her body, including her face and her hair, had been mostly burnt. And next to her body, they found jewelry, they found empty bottles that had the labels peeled off. They would find a watch, an umbrella, they would find some remains of nylon stockings, and rubber boots. The woman would be described as 5'4", with brown eyes, long dark hair. They said that she could be between 25 and 40 years old. And what was most distinctive about this was her teeth. She had 14 fillings and several gold crowns. And this was obviously very unusual for her age and for Norway. They hadn't practiced this type of dental work yet, so they knew that she probably didn't live there. The autopsy would conclude that, that the woman died from a combination of sleeping pills and carbon monoxide. And they said that maybe the carbon monoxide poisoning came from the fact that there was a fire next to her, but there is much debate and conflicting reports about a fire and if it was even next to her. And to everyone's surprise, her death was noted as a probable suicide, though many people don't believe that's the case. And one of the forensic investigators would give an interview to BBC in 2017. They would go on and say, the placement and location of the object surrounding the body was strange. It looked like there had been some kind of ceremony. During the autopsy, the coroner would find about 50 sleeping pills, but they had not started to digest at the time of her death. They also would find soot in her lungs, which meant she was alive as she was being lit on fire. There was bruising on her neck, and they said that could be from a possible fall or somebody hitting her. So the medical examiner did rule as a suicide, and that was basically because of the large amount of sleeping pills in her system and the high levels of carbon monoxide. Three days after the body of this woman was discovered, investigators would get their first clue. Police would find two suitcases at the railway station's luggage department, and there was a fingerprint on some of the items in there, and they traced it back to this dead woman that they had found. Now that they have the suitcases and they open them, they realize this case just got stranger. Inside the contents of the suitcase had been glasses, clothes with tags that were cut off, there were different types of wigs, there was different types of money, there was German, Norwegian, Belgian, British, and Swiss coins. Even more interesting, they found a notepad with rows of handwritten letters and numbers, and they realized that this was code. This woman was writing in code, and investigators immediately wanted to solve this code, this riddle, to figure out who this woman was. All of these strange things, the way she was found, the things in her suitcases, everything just seemed very eerie about this case. Eventually, investigators would crack the code, and it indicated dates and places where this woman had been staying. Inside the suitcase, they would also find a plastic bag from a footwear store. And this was a store in Norway, which was about 120 miles from where she was actually found. The owner's son would remember this woman, and he said that she was well-dressed, was nice-looking, and he said that she took a long time to decide on those specific boots. He would say that she had an English accent, and that she had a strange smell about her. Years later, the same person would say that the smell was garlic, that she smelled like garlic. 
apparently garlic hadn't been very common in the 70s and 80s in Norway. So obviously the fact that he couldn't identify the smell wasn't strange because it wasn't something common there at the time. But years later, he realized, wow, this is garlic. She smelled like garlic. And I think that's what's amazing about our brains is we can smell something or taste something and suddenly have this memory from it. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened to him. He smelled garlic and he had that instant realization, oh my God, that woman smelled of garlic. I want to know that that adds to another level in this case. What had she been doing prior? Was she eating garlic? Where was she prior to this? Just adds a whole nother layer to this very eerie and strange case as is. He would go on to say, she was a customer who took up space, asked a lot of questions, and spent a long time making up her mind. Her English was poor, and I remember a certain peculiar scent. They would start calling this woman the Isdal woman. They couldn't identify her. They had no idea who she was. So that's the nickname that kind of stuck with this case. The police traced the woman's movements to a hotel. Of course, she had to check in, and when she checked in, she checked in under the name Fenella Lorch. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but... Vanilla. It wasn't her real name, it was an alias, and they soon uncovered quite a few aliases that she had been using during that time in the 1970s. Investigators would note that in order to check in the hotel, she would have presumably had to show a passport, but they didn't find any passports in the hotel rooms where she had previously stayed, they didn't find it in her luggage, and definitely not on her at the scene where she was murdered or committed suicide. But they did note that a nearly destroyed plastic cover, possibly one for a passport, was located near the body. So if she had been murdered, somebody probably did take the time to burn that passport. Hotel staff would also go on to say that they recognized her. They said she was fashionable, she was quiet, she spoke poor English, as well as German. One waitress would say that she remembered this woman dining next to two German naval officers. And she would say that this woman, this Isdal woman, was very confident. She seemed well-traveled, well-dressed. She said that she often requested to change rooms and that she had a gap in her front teeth and was probably in her 20s. In spite of the fact that it seems like there was a lot of clues in this case, police weren't able to solve it. They didn't know who this woman was, they weren't able to identify her, and in early 1971, Norway's authorities just decided to close the case. They would bury her in a zinc coffin so that they can preserve her remains just in case relatives come forward or something along those lines. In late 2016, the case would become open again. And now because it's 2016, we have a lot of technology that they didn't have in 1970. They would do an analysis on the enamel on the woman's teeth. And because of this, it showed that she most likely spent her childhood somewhere along the border between France and Germany. They said around age 14 that she probably lived in border areas of Germany, France, Luxembourg, Belgium. They deemed her age closer to 30 or 40, and they did have preserved DNA and tissue samples because of how they buried her. And because of this, they're hoping to find a next of kin. And if you can find a next of kin, you can hopefully identify the woman and determine who she was. Of course, there's tons of theories about the Isdale woman. Police are very reluctant to close the case during the 1970s, and they basically believed it was closed too soon, and that something serious had happened there. Many of them didn't believe it was a suicide. Many believe the case was closed because it had larger implications if the woman was identified as a spy. So the main theory is that obviously the Isdale woman was a spy, or she worked closely with an intelligence agency. And we conclude that because the manner of her death where she was found was very remote and kind of isolated. She very much tried to hide her identity. She gave false names when she traveled. She had efforts to change her appearance in her suitcases. And all of that kind of points to this identity that's very secret, and people firmly believe that she was a spy. I'm not a historian, but what I've uncovered through research is that at the time she was in Norway in the 1970s, there was an important NATO weapon being tested. And I'm not sure how true it is, but they said that Norway was kind of a hub of Russian and Israel spies. Again, I'm not really sure how truthful that is, but that is what I found. And that's apparently why many people believe that she could have been a spy herself. But a former KGB agent and espionage historian by the name of Alexander doesn't agree with this theory. He'd say that if she had been a Soviet spy, he said that she would have one or two very carefully crafted identities and which she would have to stick to anywhere she went. And he would say that he believes that she was a courier or a messenger. Basically, her job would be to deliver information from a spy, someone already well-known and well-versed in that area and, and living there. They have a life, they're immersed into that life, and her job was to go to the spy 
collect the information and then take it back to you know the central intelligence you would say that her profile is just somebody passing by not caring to keep up a single identity and he said that's consistent with a person who is just trying to pass along information and not blend in of course we can all speculate that perhaps she was a spy there's just too many things that indicate that this was probably a murder and not a suicide I'm actually really excited to see what happens if they do identify this woman and perhaps they already identified this woman but haven't released the information if she was a spy if she was somebody working with central intelligence in another country it could be something that they don't release but i guess we'll have to wait and see for our second case we're going to talk about jennifer fairgate on may 31st 1995 a woman who went by the name of jennifer fairgate checked into the oslo plaza hotel in norway Jennifer would check into the hotel using a fake name and a non-existent Belgian address. And she would do so all without identification and without a credit card. And because she spelled her name wrong on the forms multiple times, investigators believe that obviously it wasn't her real name. So it seems like she was using a fake name because if that's your real name, you're gonna spell it properly. On the same hotel forms, there had apparently been a man's name as well. And this man checked in with Jennifer Fairgate and his name was Louis Fairgate. A witness would say that Jennifer did check in with a man, but people are wondering if there was hotel security and if that had been verified or not. So on June 3rd, a hotel employee goes and knocks on Jennifer Fairgate's door. And as they're knocking, they hear a gunshot. They would go, they would get security, and security would come in about 15 minutes. They would open the door and it would appear that she was the only one staying there at the time. This woman had no purse or toiletries. There was no passport, but all of the labels had been removed from her clothing. And it was strange because it seemed like she only packed clothing for her upper body. There was no trousers or skirts or dresses. What was also strange is the door had appeared to be double locked from the inside. And a gun that was found at the scene had the serial numbers removed with acid. So because the room was double locked from the inside, investigators immediately jumped to suicide. But apparently investigators would do a test and they realized that somebody could have theoretically killed her and then locked the doors. It apparently wasn't that complicated. So of course this brings on an assassination theory. Was she a spy? Did somebody assassinate her for a certain reason? They covered up the crime, they left, and it all happened in a short amount of time. A hotel employee comes, they knock on the door, the gunshot happens, they leave to get security. And in that time, you know, this person is able to get out of the hotel undetected apparently. And I mentioned that there was no toiletries in the hotel, but there was evidence that somebody had showered and there was a bottle of men's cologne. So in 2016, Fairgate's body was exhumed and they did obtain a DNA sample. Although she remains unidentified, they suspect that she was 24 years old at the time of her death and was of European heritage. And hotel employees would say when they spoke with her, she sounded like she had been from East Germany. A Norwegian intelligence officer would say that Fairgate was most likely a secret agent who had been tracked down and assassinated. He would say that cutting tags off of clothing is a common procedure for agents as well as removing serial numbers from guns. And they also noted that she never really left the hotel room while she was staying there. They would note that the key card data showed that she left her room once and didn't return for 20 hours. I would assume that investigators looked into that and tried to figure out where she was within those 20 hours, but I'm not sure they came up with anything. Of course, this case is very similar to the Isdale woman because she wasn't traveling with anything like toiletries. There was no passport found. It seems she brought very limited things with her. Tags had been cut out of her clothing. Just too many similarities between the two to ignore. And both of them happen in Norway, which leads us to our third and final case today. In 1987, so before Jennifer Fairgate, a man only known as the Cambo Man was found dead near train tracks in South Norway. Like Jennifer Fairgate, like the Isdale woman, he had no identification, but the tags had been cut out of his clothing. And another unsettling piece of information is that when a DNA test was done, it also revealed a connection to Belgium, like the Isdale woman. When this man was found, he was missing an arm and a foot and investigators ruled that he had probably been hit by a train. Apparently, a train had gone through there, and witnesses said that they saw this man standing by the tracks. And, of course, people were saying, well, perhaps this was suicide. You know, maybe he just decided to step in front of a train. He had had enough with life. But again, what's strange about that is he had no identification. He had no tags in his clothing, which is very eerie and very similar to the other two cases. They did circulate his picture with Interpol and nobody came forward to claim him as a family member. He had on hospital style compression socks, which I guess was something you wear to prevent blood clots. 
but during the autopsy, it was revealed that he was in good health, so it doesn't add up as to why he was wearing those socks. From my understanding, the Campbell man was wearing clothing that was probably purchased in Germany, and he had cigarettes that were manufactured in an East German market. I'm not sure how true it is, but it is noted that authorities did wash the man's clothing, which wouldn't make much sense because you want to preserve evidence. But his manner of death doesn't make sense. Did he step in front of the train himself? Was he pushed? Was he having a meeting at that time and it went wrong? Something about it just doesn't sit right, but there are noticeable conclusions to draw given the fact that he had these German clothing on, he had tags cut out. The similarities between the three all just seem quite eerie. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. Did I miss any evidence? Have there been any new updates since recording this video? What are your theories on the case? Were these three people spies? Were they just three seemingly different victims. I would love to know your thoughts. But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video or any other video on my channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss video upload. If there's a case you'd like me to cover, pop it in the comments below. Check out some other videos on my channel while you wait for the next upload, and I'll see you later.